Good day. This is Raw Thoughtcast, the words of Aaron Schwartz, with your host, Swasi Swas. Episode 1, including posts 1 through 7, as posted in ascending order, but not according to date. I will be reflecting on the posts and my reasons for doing this work after the podcast. So stay tuned. Thank you. Raw Thought by Aaron Swartz, DJB, English, translated by Matahiro Takamamuto. I think it's time for everyone to remember that DJ Bernstein is the greatest programmer in the history of the world. First, let's look at the objective facts. DJB wrote two important system software, mail servers and DNS servers. Both are used by millions of domains. It can handle all kinds of complex tasks, has no problem with extremely high loads, and can handle any abnormal situation. They're working exactly the same as when Bernstein first released them. One bug, just one, has been found in Qmail. The second bug was reported to DJBDNS. But what's important is the fact that it took people nearly a decade to find the bug. I don't know of any other programmer who can do this. Donald Nuth has a good line, but his diary about text literary programming to read you can see that he's been searching for bugs for years and he thinks that his journey will never end. You can only repeat the steps so that you asymptote at the end, which is why there is that weird version numbering convention. Not only has it not been able to break the DJB record, but no one has even come close to it. But the more important factor is subjective. The DJB program is a work of art. It is a great work that should be understood with sensitivity. DJB chords are as pleasing to the look of their outlines as good art. There's balance and rhythm to it and it's as good as the best typography. As with any great poem, each letter has a meaning. Each letter is there because you need it. But programs aren't just meant to be read. Dance like a graceful dancer, not only as a single dancer, but also as a ballet suite, dividing, moving, and putting them back together at an astonishing speed, over and over again. But unlike dance, these movements have a purpose. The program does what it needs to do. In other words, find a website and send mail from one place to another. In the most amazing scenario, mail delivery and sorting is like a huge, never-ending ballet suite. Think of the Brazilian sitcom The Office. But this is not a temporary illusion. This is how your emails are processed every day. And it's not just about being appreciated. It's a dance with a purpose. The internal structure is perfectly crafted to minimize moving parts. It's designed to do the tasks you need to do with minimal effort. The way the processing content is divided and allocated is nothing short of superb. When I say brilliant here, I don't just mean it in a linguistic sense. Of course, that's part of it. It's because of the efficiency that is backed by elegant mathematics. The mathematical formula of the Mr. Miss ensures that the program works perfectly in theory and that there is no better way to do it. I still can't fully explain the incredible beauty of DJB software. The DJB program is not only a machine that the best teams of great skills will admire. It's also a well-worn prop that's meant to be used by people. As can be seen in good industrial design, DJB software is a joy every time you use it. Is there any other discipline that combines the beauty of language, mathematics, art, design, and function? Programming clearly belongs to a unique domain, so who can beat DJB? Who else has opened up so many possibilities? Did anyone know that there was such a possibility? Oddly enough, there are a lot of Mr. Miss, people who express their hatred of DJB. One of the reasons is due to the general aversion to genius. It's clear that DJB has a strong, uncompromising vision, which often leads to misconceptions of arrogance and rudeness. Another reason is the pragmatism's disregard for good design. DJB programs don't work the same way they do most programs. There's a simple reason for that. Most programs do things wrong. But his hatred for DJBS goes deeper than that. I don't know for sure. But frankly, I suspect that people who are not in good taste are angry and frustrated at the sight of their admiration for something they don't understand. Good art is always accompanied by slander. I'm not saying that DJB does a perfect job. As I said, there are bugs, and the log files are not very graceful. If DJB were to rewrite the software now, there would be a huge amount of change. But then, who has stood up to give it a try? No one even knows if they can do it, right? Until I read the DJB code, I had no idea what good art and software was. And now, any other code I read feels dull. Bonus. 
If you've read this far, you're probably interested in what DJV is doing right now. Original. DJV by Aaron Swartz's Raw Thought. You should follow me on Twitter here. October 26, 2009. Powered by Thanfor. Raw Thought. By Aaron Swartz. How do I hire programmers? English. Translated by Ipadizados. There are three questions when you're hiring a programmer or any other worker, for that matter. Is it smart? Can you get the job done? Can I work with it? Someone who is smart but doesn't get the job done should be your friend, not your employee. You can talk about your problems while procrastinating consciously postponing work. We know we need to do with their actual work. Someone who gets the job done but isn't smart is inefficient. Those who aren't smart get the job done using the most difficult way and working with them is slow and frustrating. Finally, someone you can't work with. Well, you can't work with him. The traditional process of hiring programmers consists of a reading a resume, b asking some tough questions in a phone conversation, and c giving them a programming problem in person. I think it's a horrible system for hiring someone. Very little can be learned from a resume, and people get nervous when you ask them complex questions in an interview. Programming isn't your typical job done under pressure, so watching how someone behaves when they're nervous is pretty useless and the interview questions that are usually asked seem to be chosen simply to be cruel. I think I'm a pretty good programmer, but I've never made it through one of those interviews, and I doubt I'll ever be able to. So when I have to hire people, I try to answer the three questions I posed at the beginning. To find out if they can get the job done, I ask them what they've done. If they're really doing their job, they should have something done by now. It's hard to be a good programmer without some kind of previous experience and these days everyone can get experience collaborating on some free software project. So I ask them for a sample of the code and a demo and see if I like it. You learn a lot quickly, because you're not looking at them as they answer a complex interview question. You're looking at the actual code they produce. Is it concise? Of course. Elegant? Usable? Is it something you'd want in your product? To find out if someone is smart, I have a casual conversation with them. I do my best to take the pressure off. I meet the person in a cafe, tell them clearly that it's not an interview. I do my best to be informal and friendly. Under no pretext do I ask them standard interview questions. I just talk to them like I would someone I meet at a party. If you ask people you meet at a party to list their strengths and weaknesses or estimate the number of piano tuners in Madrid, you've got more serious problems. I think it's pretty simple to tell if someone is smart while having a casual conversation with them. I'm constantly making judgments about whether the people I'm meeting are smart, just as I'm constantly evaluating whether the people I see seem attractive to me. But if I had to write down what it is that makes someone seem smart to me, I'd put the emphasis on three things. The first one, do they have knowledge? Ask them what they've been thinking about and check their level of knowledge about it. Do they seem to understand it in detail? Can you explain it clearly? Clear explanations are a sign that they really know the subject. Do they know things about that that you don't? Second, are they curious? Do they respond by asking you questions about you? Are they genuinely interested or are they just being educated? Do they ask questions about what you're saying? Do their questions make you think? Third, do they learn? At some point in the conversation, you'll probably end up explaining something to him. Do they really get it or do they just nod and smile? There are people who know things about some small area but are not curious about others. And there are people who are curious, but don't learn. They ask a lot of questions, but they're not really listening. And I want someone who accomplishes all three listening plus asking plus learning. Finally, I conclude if I can work with someone by spending some time with that person. A lot of brilliant people may seem nice in an hour long conversation, but their eccentricities become apparent after a couple of hours. So once you've finished the talk, Invite them over for lunch with the rest of the team or a game at the office. Of course, I keep things as informal as possible. The goal is precisely to see if they get on your nerves. If everything seems right and I feel ready to hire someone, I do a small final security check to confirm that they haven't given it to me with cheese. I ask them to do some of the work. Typically, this means choosing a sufficiently independent part of the project and asking them to write it down if you really need to see someone working under pressure. Give them a due date. If necessary, you can offer to pay them for the work, but most programmers I've come across don't mind you tasking them with a small task like this as long as they can publish the code for their work when it's finished. This test doesn't work on its own. 
But if someone has passed the first three parts, it should be enough to prove that they haven't cheated you and that they can actually get the job done. You should follow me on Twitter here. December 30, 2009. Powered by Thankful Or. Raw Thought. By Aaron Swartz. Because we can. When I first started studying the First Amendment nearly a decade ago. Yikes, this is a very overdue blog post. I read about the different theories trying to make sense of it. Some scholars argued the First Amendment's goal was to create a robust marketplace of ideas. If everyone could share their opinion, the truth could come out through robust debate. Others concluded the First Amendment was a sort of logical safeguard by protecting speech and assembly and petitions for redress of grievances that guaranteed people the right to work against laws they disapprove of, kind of the way the Second Amendment is said to be a bulwark against totalitarianism. These aren't just theoretical debates. The theories have practical consequences for how one interprets that key amendment. If you believe it's for a marketplace of ideas, then you will support regulation aimed at correcting market failures by suppressing certain kinds of problematic speech. If you believe it's a political safeguard, then you will not be too worried about speech regulation aimed at clearly non-political speech. Now, I'm not quite sure why such a theory is needed. The First Amendment always struck me as perfectly clear. Congress shall make no law. No law meant no law, at least with regard to content. I'm more lenient when it comes to regulating other aspects. But if one has to have a theory, it struck me the right one was something completely different. Because we can. The framers were very skeptical of government. The system they designed was full of checks and fetters, of which the First Amendment is probably the most extreme, unless you believe in a libertarian conception of the Tenth. They saw government as a necessary evil. They were willing to accept it, but they wanted to constrain it where they could. And speech is a very obvious way to constrain it. A government needs to be able to stop violence and make war and so on, or its people will get very badly hurt. But there's no reason it has to stop speech. As the old saying goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words do hurt, of course, but theirs is a tolerable pain. People and society are on even in the face of grievous insults. And so the framers decided to exclude this class of regulation from the government's ambit. Not because speech is particularly good, but because it's not particularly bad. Because it's one thing they could safely exclude. Because we can. The implications of this theory for interpretation are obvious. They lead to the most expansive conception of the First Amendment compatible with the other goals of government a stable democratic body to promote the general welfare, and so on. That's certainly further than any court heretofore has gone, and probably a bit further than I'd personally prefer. But isn't that what fetters are for? You should follow me on Twitter here. October 20, 2009. Powered by Thinful. Raw Thought. By Aaron Swartz. What happens at the end of Infinite Jest? Or, the Infinite Jest ending explained. Herb. Is there no ending to infinite book because there couldn't be? Or did you just get tired of writing it? DFW. There is an ending as far as I'm concerned. Certain kind of parallel lines are supposed to start converging in such a way that an end can be projected by the reader somewhere beyond the right frame. If no such convergence or projection occurred to you, then the books failed for you. Live online with David Foster Wallace, May 17, 1996. Warning. This whole thing is one gigantic spoiler. Only read it if you've already tried to figure it out for yourself first. Gately, having relived his bottom, begins to recover from his infection. But at the same time, Hal's condition deepens. Ever since Hal ate the mold as a child, he's been a brilliant communicator, but unable to feel. 694. Hal himself hasn't had a bona fide intensity of interior life type emotion since he was tiny. In fact, he's far more robotic than John Wayne. Joy was the only one who could see it. In life, everyone thought Joy was just being crazy, but in death as a wraith, he can actually read Hal's thoughts and thus confirm his view. In life, he created the entertainment to draw Hal out. Hal moves outwardly, but doesn't feel inside. Victims of the entertainment feel something inside, but don't move outwardly. After all, as he tells Gately, he was willing to resort to desperate measures. No, no. Any conversation or interchange between father and son is better than none at all. 839. Joy's wraith is responsible for the strange disturbances around either tripods in the forest, moving Ortho's bed, healing tiles on the floor, 
He knocks the ceiling tiles down in an attempt to find the DMZ. Pemulis is too distracted with getting expelled to have Hal take it, so Joy needs to get it to Hal some other way. Joy also created DMZ as part of an attempt to undo the effects of Hal's eating mold as a child recall. DMZ is a mold that grows on a mold. He left it along with the entertainment recall. He the kids find Joy's personal effects 670. A bulky old doorless microwave, a load of old TP cartridges mostly unlabeled. The tapes and the DMZ are delivered together to the FLQ, which is about this goal. It stars a woman named Madame Psychosis, a street name for DMZ explaining that the thing that killed you in your last life will give birth to you in the next. The DMZ and the entertainment were meant to go together for Hal. Now that the entertainment has escaped, he needs to get Hal the DMZ. Hal never leaves leaves his toothbrush unattended 870, but that's no problem for a wraith. He places the DMZ on Hal's brush, and Hal brushes his teeth 860, and immediately begins experiencing symptoms. Ortho thinks Hal's crying when Hal thinks he's speaking in a neutral tone 862. Hal's symptoms indeed begin to reverse. He is now unable to properly communicate feelings people see him as either laughing hysterically or terribly sad, but beginning to actually feel like Gately. He spends a lot of time lying on the floor, thinking about the past, the hero of non-action from his essay 142. While before, everyone could hear him except Joy. Now only Joy can hear him since, as with Gately, you can hear Hal's thoughts. By the time of the match, his symptoms are so bad, he's taken by ambulance to the hospital 16. The only other emergency room I have ever been in was almost exactly one year back, safely escaping the AFR's assault. Like fellow student Otis P. Lork, he gets the bed next to Gately. Joel, who is at the hospital for a meeting, visits Gately on her way out and recognizes Hal. She tells them both about the hunt for the lethal entertainment and the resulting continental emergency, and they all go to dig up Joy's grave. They persuade John Wayne, a spy for the AFR, to become a double agent and help sneak them into Joy's Quebec burial site. Wayne presumably tells the AFR, he is actually a triple agent that he will steal the tape as soon as Hal digs it up. But, as with Mary, his loyalties are ultimately even numbered and 40. The AFR finds out and brutally murders him, which is why he can't win the Whataburger 16F, as Gately foresees. He's with a very sad kid, and they're in a graveyard digging some dead guy's head up, and it's really important, like continental emergency important, and Gately's the best digger, but he's wicked hungry, like irresistibly hungry, and he's eating with both hands out of huge economy-sized bags of corporate snacks, so he can't really dig. While it gets later and later and the sad kid is trying to scream at Gately that the important thing was buried in the guy's head and to divert the continental emergency to start digging the guy's head up before it's too late. But the kid moves his mouth but nothing comes out and Joel Vandy appears while the sad kid holds something terrible up by the hair and makes the face of somebody shouting in panic. Too late. 934. It's too late because someone got there first and took the anti-entertainment cartridge 126 embedded in Joy's head 31. Whoever took it is presumably the person who's made and mailed the extant copies. It couldn't be the AFR, or OUS, or they wouldn't still be searching for it. It probably wasn't the FLQs, because they didn't know how to read master cartridges, they just thought there were blank tapes and their displays were blank. 483 and 205, it couldn't be Avril acting alone. She has problems, but she's not that kind of cold-blooded killer. It had to have been Orin one. Orin, who never attended his father's funeral, went to the gravesite and dug up his father, releasing the wraith in the process. 244. After a burial, rural Papano region quavisers purportedly drill a small hole down from ground level all the way down through the lid of the coffin to let out the soul if it wants out. Orin who is such a partisan of his father that he feels the need to repeatedly ruin the lives of people like his mother, has been mailing the tapes to his father's enemies in revenge. Disapproving film critics in Berkeley and the medical attaché whose affair with his mother drove himself especially wild in Boston. It's possible he's being influenced by the wraith in these actions. After the AFR releases roaches into his giant glass tumbler, Orrin cuts a deal with AFR and gives them the tape in return for letting him live. He's apparently still alive on page 14. The AFR uses the tape to set off some sort of intracontinental conflagration 16. Some sort of ultra mock fighter too high overhead to hear slices the sky from south to north. 
which apparently topples the gentle administration N114. YG is the very last year of subsidized time. As seen in Chapter 1, Hal's condition deepens until he literally can't communicate at all, but no longer feels like a robot anymore. 12. I'm not a machine. I feel and believe. The only thing he has left is tennis, and he looks forward to playing Ortho Stice in the final match of the Whataburger. But Stice is possessed by his father in the manuscript. Stice is called the Racer. So the novel ends as Hal finally gets to really interface with his father in the only way he has left. Thanks to Jeff Halley and Joe Jacona for help with the part about the DMZ. Recall that the padded mailer received by the attaché is postmarked suburban Phoenix area in Arizona, USA, 36 also, or in mentions being in line in the post office, even though, as Hal points out, you hate snail mail and you quit mailing the moms the pseudo form replies two years ago. 244 Orin doesn't reply to that. And there was reason to think else. Duplicis had received his original copies from this relative, an athlete. He may have borne responsibility for the razzles and dazzles of Berkeley and Boston. USA 723 The other appearances of the entertainment are New Iberia La Oren played football in New Orleans La and Temp as Oren Lives in Phoenix as. Thanks to Greg Carlisle, page 477, for catching these. You should follow me on Twitter here. September 16, 2009. Powered by Thane Four. All thought by Aaron Swartz. How to be more productive. With all the time you spend watching TV, he tells me, you could have written a novel by now. It's hard to disagree with a sentiment writing a novel is undoubtedly a better use of time than watching TV. But what about the hidden assumption? Such comments imply that time is fungible, that time spent watching TV can just as easily be spent writing a novel. And sadly, that's just not the case. Time has various levels of quality. If I'm walking to the subway station and I've forgotten my notebook, then it's pretty hard for me to write more than a couple paragraphs. And it's tough to focus when you keep getting interrupted. There's also a mental component. Sometimes I feel happy and motivated and ready to work on something. But other times I feel so sad and tired, I can only watch TV. If you want to be more productive then, you have to recognize this fact and deal with it. First, you have to make the best of each kind of time. And second, you have to try to make your time higher quality. Spend time efficiently. Choose good problems. Life is short or so I'm told so why waste it doing something dumb. It's easy to start working on something because it's convenient. But you should always be questioning yourself about it. Is there something more important we can work on? Why don't you do that instead? Such questions are hard to face up to eventually. If you follow this rule, You'll have to ask yourself why you're not working on the most important problem in the world, but each little step makes you more productive. This isn't to say that all your time should be spent on the most important problem in the world. Mine certainly isn't after all. I'm writing this essay, but it's definitely the standard against which I measure my life. Have a bunch of them. Another common myth is that you'll get more done if you pick one problem and focus on it exclusively. I find this is hardly ever true. Just this moment, for example, I'm trying to fix my posture, exercise some muscles, drink some fluids, clean off my desk, and with my brother, and write this essay. Over the course of the day, I've worked on this essay, read a book, had some food, answered some email, chatted with friends, done some shopping, worked on a couple other essays, backed up my hard drive, and organized my book list. In the past week, I've worked on several different software projects, read several different books, studied a couple different programming languages, moved some of my stuff, and so on. Having a lot of different projects gives you work for different qualities of time. Plus, you'll have other things to work on if you get stuck or bored, and that can give your mind time to unstick yourself. It also makes you more creative. Creativity comes from applying things you learn in other fields to the field you work in. If you have a bunch of different projects going in different fields, then you have many more ideas you can apply. Make a list. Coming up with a bunch of different things to work on shouldn't be hard. Most people have tons of stuff they want to get done. But if you try to keep it all in your head, it quickly gets overwhelming. The psychic pressure of having to remember all of it can make you crazy. The solution is again simple. Write it down. Once you have a list of all the things you want to do, you can organize it by kind. For example, my list is programming, writing, thinking, errands, reading, listening, and watching in that order. 
most major projects involve a bunch of these different tasks. Writing this, for example, involves reading about other procrastination systems, thinking up new sections of the article, cleaning up sentences, emailing people with questions, and so on, all in addition to the actual work of writing the text. Each task can go under the appropriate section, so that you can do it when you have the right kind of time. Integrate the list with your life. Once you have this list, the problem becomes remembering to look at it. And the best way to remember to look at it is to make looking at it what you would do anyway. For example, I keep a stack of books on my desk, with the ones I'm currently reading on top. When I need a book to read, I just grab the top one off the stack. I do the same thing with TV movies. Whenever I hear about a movie I should watch, I put it in a special folder on my computer. Now whenever I feel like watching TV, I just open up that folder. I've also thought about some more intrusive ways of doing this. For example, a web page that pops up with a list of articles in my to read folder whenever I try to check some web logs. Or maybe even a window that pops up with work suggestions occasionally for me to see when I'm goofing off. Make your time higher quality. Making the best use of the time you have can only get you so far. The much more important problem is making more higher quality time for yourselves. Most people's time is eaten up by things like school and work. Obviously, if you attend one of these, you should stop. But what else can you do? Ease physical constraints. Carry pen and paper. Pretty much everyone interesting I know has some sort of pocket notebook they carry at all times. Pen and paper is immediately useful in all kinds of circumstances if you need to write something down for somebody, take notes on something, scratch down an idea, and so on. I've even written whole articles in the Subway 1. I used to do this, but now I just carry my computer phone everywhere. It doesn't let me give people information physically, but it makes up for it by giving me something to read all the time email and pushing my notes straight into my email inbox, where I'm forced to deal with them right away. Avoid being interrupted. For tasks that require serious focus, you should avoid getting interrupted. One simple way is to go somewhere interrupters can't find you. Another is to set up an agreement with the people around you. Don't bother me when the door is closed or in me if I have headphones on, and then you can ignore the M's until you're free. You don't want to overdo it. Sometimes if you're really wasting time, you should be distracted. It's a much better use of time to help someone else with their problem than it is to sit and read the news. That's why setting up specific agreements is a good idea. You can be interrupted when you're not really focusing. Use mental constraints. Eat, sleep, exercise. Time when you're hungry or tired or twitchy is low quality time. Improving it is simple. Eat, sleep, and exercise. Yet I somehow manage to screw up even this. I don't like going to get food. So I'll often work right through being hungry and end up so tired out that I can't bring myself to go get food too. It's tempting to say to yourself, I know I'm tired, but I can't take a nap. I have work to do. In fact, you'll be much more productive if you do take that nap, since you'll improve the quality of the day's remaining time and you are going to have to sleep sometime anyway. I don't really exercise much, so I'm probably not the best person to give advice on that bit, but I do try to work it in where I can. While I'm lying down reading, I do sit-ups, and when I need to go somewhere on foot, I run. Talk to cheerful people. Easing mental constraints is much harder. One thing that helps is having friends who are cheerful. For example, I always find myself much more inclined to work after talking to Paul Graham or Dan Connolly. They just radiate energy. It's tempting to think that you need to get away from people and shut yourself off in your room to do any real work. But this can be so demoralizing that it's actually less efficient. Share the load. Even if your friends aren't cheerful, just working on a hard problem with someone else makes it much easier. For one thing, the mental weight gets spread across both people. For another, having someone else there forces you to work instead of getting distracted. Procrastination and the mental force view. But all of this is sort of dodging the issue. The real productivity problem people have is procrastination. It's something of a dirty little secret, but everyone procrastinates severely. It's not just you, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to stop it. What is procrastination? To the outside observer, it looks like you're just doing something fun like playing a game or reading the news instead of doing your actual work. This usually causes the outside observer to think you're lazy and bad. But the real question is, what's going on inside your head? 
I've spent a bunch of time trying to explore this, and the best way I can describe it is that your brain puts up a sort of mental force field around a task. Ever play with two magnets? If you orient the magnets properly and try to push them towards each other, they'll repel fiercely. As you move them around, you can sort of feel out the edges of the magnetic field. And as you try to bring the magnets together, the field will push you back or off in another direction. The mental block seems to work in the same way. It's not particularly solid or visible, but you can sort of feel it around the edges. And the more you try to go towards it, the more it pushes you away. And so, not surprisingly, you end up going in another direction free. And just as you can't get two repelling magnets to sit together just by pushing real hard, they'll fling back as soon as you stop pushing. I've never been able to overcome this mental force field through sheer willpower. Instead, you have to be sneaky about it. You have to rotate a magnet. So what causes the mental force field? There appear to be two major factors, whether the task is hard and whether it's assigned. Hard problems. Break it down. The first kind of hard problem is the problem that's too big. Say you want to build a recipe organizing program. Nobody can really just sit down and build a recipe organizer. That's a goal, not a task. A task is a specific concrete step you can take towards your goal. A good first task might be something like Draw a mock-up of the screen that displays a recipe. Now that's something you can do for. And when you do that, the next steps become clearer. You have to decide what a recipe consists of, what kind of search features are needed, how to structure the recipe database, and so on. You build up a momentum, each task leading to the next. And as your brain gets crunching on the subject, it becomes easier to solve that subject's problems. For each of my big projects, I think of all the tasks I can do next for them and add them to my categorized to-do list see above. And when I stop working on something, I add its next possible task to the to-do list. Simplify it. Another kind of hard problem is the one that's too complicated or audacious. Writing a book seems daunting, so start by doing an essay. If an essay is too much, start by writing a paragraph summary. The important thing is to have something done right away. Once you have something, you can judge it more accurately and understand the problem better. It's also much easier to improve something that already exists than to work at a blank page. If your paragraph goes well, then maybe it can grow into an essay and then into a book, little by little, a perfectly reasonable piece of writing all the way through. Think about it. Often the key to solving a hard problem will be getting some piece of inspiration. If you don't know much about the field, you should obviously start by researching it, see how other people did things, get a sense of the terrain sit and try and understand the field fully. Do some smaller problems to see if you have a handle on it. Assign problems. Assign problems are problems you're told to work on. Numerous psychology experiments have found that when you try to incentivize people to do something, they're less likely to do it and do a worse job. External incentives, like rewards and punishments, shows what psychologists call your intrinsic motivation, your natural interest in the problem. This is one of the most thoroughly replicated findings of social psychology. Over 70 studies have found that rewards undermine interest in the task. People's heads seem to have a deep avoidance of being told what to do. The weird thing is that this phenomenon isn't just limited to other people. It even happens when you try to tell yourself what to do. If you say to yourself, I should really work on X. That's the most important thing to do right now. Then all of a sudden X becomes the toughest thing in the world to make yourself work on. But as soon as Y becomes the most important thing, the exact same X becomes much easier. Create a false assignment. This presents a rather obvious solution. If you want to work on X, tell yourself to do Y. Unfortunately, it's sort of difficult to trick yourself intentionally because you know you're doing it. Seven, so you've got to be sneaky about it. One way is to get someone else to assign something to you. The most famous instance of this is grad students who are required to write a dissertation a monumentally difficult task that they need to do to graduate. And so, to avoid doing this, grad students end up doing all sorts of other hard stuff. The task has to both seem important you have to do this to graduate, and big hundreds of pages of your best work, but not actually be so important that putting it off is going to be a disaster. Don't assign problems to yourself. It's very tempting to say, all right, I need to put all this aside, hunker down and finish this essay. Even worse is to try to bribe yourself into doing something, like saying, Alright, if I just finish this essay, then I'll go and eat some candy. 
but the absolute worst of all is to get someone else to try to force you to do something. All of these are very tempting. I've done them all myself, but they're completely counterproductive. In all three cases, you've basically assigned yourself a task. Now your brain is going to do everything it can to escape it. Make things fun. Hard work isn't supposed to be pleasant, we're told. But in fact, it's probably the most enjoyable thing I do. Not only does a tough problem completely absorb you while you're trying to solve it, but afterwards you feel wonderful having accomplished something so serious. So the secret to getting yourself to do something is not to convince yourself you have to do it, but to convince yourself that it's fun. And if it isn't, then you need to make it fun. I first got serious about this when I had to write essays for college. Writing essays isn't a particularly hard task, but it sure is a sign. Who would voluntarily write a couple pages connecting the observations of two random books? So I started making the essays into my own little jokes. For one, I decided to write each paragraph in its own little style, trying my best to imitate various forms of speech. This had the added benefit of padding things out eight. Another way to make things more fun is to solve the meta problem. Instead of building a web application, try building a web application framework with this as the example app. Not only will the task be more enjoyable, but the result will probably be more useful. Conclusion There are a lot of myths about productivity that time is fungible, that focusing is good, that bribing yourself is effective, that hard work is unpleasant, that procrastinating is unnatural, but they all have a common theme. A conception of real work as something that goes against your natural inclinations. And for most people and most jobs, this may be the case. There's no reason you should be inclined to write boring essays or file pointless memos. And if society is going to force you to do so anyway, then you need to learn to shut out the voices in your head telling you to stop. But if you're trying to do something worthwhile and creative, then shutting down your brain is entirely the wrong way to go. The real secret to productivity is the reverse, to listen to your body, to eat when you're hungry, to sleep when you're tired, to take a break when you're bored, to work on projects that seem fun and interesting. It seems all too simple. It doesn't involve any fancy acronyms or self-determination or personal testimonials from successful businessmen. It almost seems like common sense. But society's conception of work has pushed us in the opposite direction. If we want to be more productive, all we need to do is turn around. Further reading. If you want to learn more about the physiology of motivation, there is nothing better than Alfie Cohn. He's written many articles on the subject and an entire book. Punished by Rewards, which I highly recommend. I hope to address how to quit school in a future essay, but you should really just go out and pick up the Teenage Liberation Handbook. If you're a computer person, one way to quit your job is by applying for funding from Y Combinator. Meanwhile, Mickey Z's book The Murdering of My Years features artists and activists describing how they manage to make ends meet while still doing what they want. Notes. Believe it or not, I actually have written in subways. It's easy to come up with excuses as to why you're not actually working, you don't have enough time before your next appointment, people are making noise downstairs, etc. But I find that when the inspiration strikes me, I can actually write stuff down on a subway car, where it's absurdly loud, and I only have a couple minutes before I have to get out and start walking. The same problem exists for sleep. There's nothing worse than being too tired to go to bed, you just feel like a zombie. Now it turns out I experienced this same phenomenon in another area, shyness. I often don't want to call a stranger up on the phone or go talk to someone at a party, and I have the exact same mental feel pushing me off in some other direction. I suspect this might be because shyness is also a trait that results from a problematic childhood. See, assign problems. Of course, this is all very speculative. While the terminology I use here, next concrete step, is derived from David Allen's getting things done. A lot of the principles here are perhaps even unconsciously applied in Extreme Programming XP. Extreme Programming is presented as the system for keeping programs organized, but I find that a lot of it is actually good advice for avoid procrastination. For example, pair programming automatically spreads the mental weight of the task across two people, as well as giving people something useful to do during lower quality times. Breaking a project down into concrete steps is another key part of XP as is getting something that works done right away and improving on its simplified infra. And these are just the things that aren't programming specific. For a fantastic overview of the literature, see Alfie Cohn, Punished by Rewards. 
This specific claim is drawn from his article Challenging Behaviorist Dogma, Myths About Money and Motivation. I originally simply assumed this was somehow biological, but Paul Graham pointed out it's more likely learned. When you're little, your parents try their best to manipulate you. They say do your homework, and your mind tries to wriggle free and think about something else. Soon enough, the wriggling becomes habit. Either way, it's going to be a tough problem to fix. I've given up trying to change this. Now I try to work around it. Richard Feynman tells a story about how he was trying to explore his own dreams, much the way I've tried to explore my own procrastination. Each night, he tried to observe what happened to himself as he fell asleep. I'm dreaming one night as usual, making observations, and then I realize I've been sleeping with the back of my head against the brass rod. I put my hand behind my head, and I feel that the back of my head is soft. I think, aha, that's why I've been able to make all these observations in my dreams. The brass rod has disturbed my visual cortex. All I have to do is sleep with the brass rod under my head, and I can make these observations anytime I want. So I think I'll stop making observations on this one and go into deeper sleep. When I woke up later, there was no brass rod, nor was the back of my head soft. Somehow, my brain had invented false reasons as to why I shouldn't observe my dreams anymore. Surely you're joking, Mr. Famous, 50. Your brain is a lot more powerful than you are. So, for example, instead of writing, by contrast, Reice doesn't quote many people. I wrote, Reice, however, whether because of a personal deficit in the skill-based capacity required for collecting orally transmitted person-centered contemporaneous ethnographies into published paper-based informative accounts, or simply a lack of preference for the reportage of community-located informational correspondence, demonstrates a total failure in producing a comparable result. The professor, apparently seriously desensitized to bad writing, never seemed to realize I was joking despite going over the paper with me one-on-one. -on -one. You should follow me on Twitter here. December 28, 2005. Powered by Thankful Oil. Raw Pop. By Aaron Swartz. What's going on here? I'm adding this post not through blogging software, like I normally do, but by hand, right into the webpage. It feels odd. I'm doing this because a week or so ago my web server started making funny error messages and not working so well. The web server is in Chicago and I am in California so it took a day or two to get someone to check on it. The conclusion was the hard drive had been fried. When the weekend ended, we sent the disk to a disk repair place. They took a look at it and a couple days later said that they couldn't do anything. The heads that normally read and write data on a hard drive by floating over the magnetized platter had crashed right into it. While the computer was giving us error messages, it was also scratching away a hole in the platter. It got so thin that you could see through it. This was just in one spot on the disk, though, so we tried calling the famed drive savers to see if they could recover the rest. They seemed to think they wouldn't have any better luck. Please, 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 tell me if you know some place to try. I hadn't backed the disk up for at least a year in fairness. I was literally going to back it up when I found it giving off error messages and the thought of the loss of all that data was crushing. I broke down crying and couldn't function. I've since been trying to piece things together from the old backup and the Google cache and so on. It's a painful and time-consuming process, and even without this on my hands, I am extremely lacking time. I'll try my best, though. Thanks to everyone for their kind words and support. If you have some files you think I might be missing, let me know. If you have some disposable income and want to help fund the purchase of a new server and perhaps the recovery of the old disk, you can make a donation. Sorry for screwing up. You should follow me on Twitter here. May 15, 2005. Powered by Thankful Work. Raw Thought. By Aaron Sports. Getting back on track. Just how crazy am I? Well, tonight I wrote my own weblogging system. One of the silver linings of losing a server is that you get to rebuild things just the way you like. Anyway, this might mean I'll start posting more. Or maybe not. Either way, this site is now proudly powered by good old make. For those who are interested, the code is now up, but it's probably not easily usable by most. You should follow me on Twitter here. June 1, 2005. Powered by Thanfor. And that was post one through eight of 
uh, Rod thought weblog of Aaron Schwartz. My greatest takeaway with what topics he chooses greatly impacts my, the ideas I have about reaching a greater audience on topics that concern me deeply. Although there are a lot of role-playing scenarios that require fertile imagination to find interest in when it comes to the aspects of efficiency and business, only being a couple of years senior to Aaron, I find I was not aware of the eccentricities of adult life so early, or even until my early 30s, truly. Aaron was a much needed, focused radical, an illuminary of my time, and was decades of maturity ahead of me. I relay your message for my own benefit to efficiently consume everything that made you who you are, to carry a torch for another victim of consequence. But it's never a question of why one c- commits to an action, but for what consequence. Thank you. 3 a.m. I almost tried to render this video without uh, the audio finished, and it crashed immediately. So that was a sign to follow the the order of operations. Uh, the technology I used to create this work was uh, Dolby On, DaVinci Resolve, uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, Core Gadget, Magic Accent Pro 11, Google PhotoScan, Inkscape, MSI, Computers, Sennheiser Headphones, Samsung Galaxy 21, Apple iPad Pro 4, and Descript Pro. I am unaware of the period when I first began the portrait of Aaron featured at the end of the video. I will attempt to make this as an artist series as well as a way for me to hear his words as I speak. I also created a sound build up to divide the weblog posts. I hope I am able to make this as creative as possible. Apologies for being dry. Leave any recommendations in the comments. You can find me on all platforms at Swassy Swass. Like and subscribe and I will be posting regular updates. So don't miss the progress by turning on notifications, please. Thanks again, Aaron XOX Swass.